I'll be honest, I have not yet emotionally recovered from this one. The Left Hand of Darkness is one of those classic books that every fan of science fiction is supposed to read at least once in their life, and many people will probably read multiple times. Perhaps it's not surprising that I haven't read it, considering that there are many books that fall into that category that I have not read, like Dune. But while reading this, I still consistently found myself wondering why I hadn't picked it up earlier, because it combines so many things that I love in a story. Namely, fantastic world building, exquisite prose, and the trope where two initially distant characters have to make a long, torturous journey over a barren landscape, getting to know each other better in the process, and potentially even falling in love. All of which is to say that, wow does this book hold up well today, and I can definitely see it becoming one of my favorite science fiction books even though there are a lot of books that I've read fairly recently that would probably fall into that category. I'll make my report as if I told a story, for I was taught as a child on my homeworld that truth is a matter of the imagination. The soundest fact may fail or prevail in the style of its telling, like that singular organic jewel of our seas, which grows brighter as one woman wears it and, worn by another, dulls and goes to dust. Facts are no more solid, coherent, round, and real than pearls are, but both are sensitive. The book takes place on a planet called Gethin, or as it's otherwise aptly known, Winter. It's a planet that is perpetually stuck in an ice age, so that large swaths of the planet, extending from the north and south poles, are covered in glaciers. And these extremely harsh conditions have stalled human development on the planet such that the sorts of technological developments you might expect to see in a hundred years on our world take thousands of years on their world. They have achieved sort of early 20th century levels of technology, but they're still probably thousands of years away from spaceflight. And notably, all of the inhabitants of this planet are androgynous. So for the most part, they are non-binary and asexual, but every individual has a sexual cycle um, at the height of which they can develop male or female genitalia. Um, any individual can develop either, and uh, at that point they will be able to reproduce. And it is to this planet that the main character Ginli I comes. Ginli is a representative of an interstellar group known as the Akuman, who are trying to convince the people of Gethin to uh, join in their sort of interstellar united nations. And considering that this book is really, all things considered, quite short, it's only about 300 pages, the world building is very, very well fleshed out. There is a really unique calendar system that I haven't seen in science fiction before, where the current year is always year one, and every new year, the previous year becomes the year one ago, and the next year becomes uh, the year one to come. And the, the calendar system and all of the world building really tie into the the unique culture of this planet, which is heavily steeped in this mindset called Shifgrathor, which is essentially just a way of denoting different social rules that everybody has to follow, but which are always unspoken. And part of the early conflict in the novel is about Ginli I trying to navigate these uh, unspoken social rules. Also related to the world building is that all of the fictional names and place names in this book, of which there are many, are all very pleasing to the ears. You can tell that Ursula K. Le Guin really put a lot of effort into making this language sound consistent and sound good. For example, just reading the names of the months uh, from the back of the book, there's Thern, Thanern, Nimmer, Honor, Irem, Moth, Tua, Osme, Okre, Kus, Hakana, Gor, Susme, Grinde. All of these names are used so frequently within the book, not these specific names only, but all of the fictional names, that it creates a, an effect that's really pleasing to the ears, especially if you read it aloud. And that's something that I believe Le Guin uh, explicitly said that she was trying to do in this book. And that kind of ties into the quality of the prose overall. The prose in this book is almost dreamlike. It's enrapturing and so full of all these fictional names and places, but also evocative descriptions of natural environments that it really almost puts you in a trance. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. There is such a focus on memory and imagination within the text itself that it really allows the reader to kind of voyeuristically experience everything that the main character is experiencing. The novel is written like a report by the main character to his superiors at the Akuman, uh, 
but with some caveats. Because there are passages interspersed with the journal entries by Ginley, uh, which are diary entries by another main character, Estervan, who is a native Gathenian. And then there are other passages that are retellings of native Gathenian tales and even some passages that are just straight up world building notes. All of these different styles kind of form this really unique, somewhat postmodern tapestry that is a little bit disorienting at first, but honestly I think is really cool. Sometimes, as I am falling asleep in a dark, quiet room, I have for a moment a great and treasurable illusion of the past. The wall of a tent leans up over my face, not visible, but audible, a slanting plane of faint sound, the susurrus of blown snow. Outside, as always, lies the great darkness, the cold, death solitude. In such fortunate moments as I fall asleep, I know beyond doubt what the real center of my life is, that time which is past and lost and yet is permanent, the enduring moment, the heart of warmth. So the first half of the book, in which you're kind of navigating all these different perspectives and trying to understand the world building, is it feels a little bit aimless uh, at times, but it's all very carefully structured because what the entire book builds up to is one sequence in the second half of the novel in which the main characters, Ginley and Estervin, have to make a long journey across the polar regions of Gethin, uh, hauling a sledge together. It's a journey that takes several months and it's so exquisitely described that you can just tell that this is kind of the sequence around which the entire book was built. Um, and I believe Le Guin even said that this is... She, she kind of like got this image in her head and realized she needed to write a novel to explain why this happened, why she had this image in her head. And that is the, that's the part of the novel where everything kind of clicked for me. It's one of those sequences in fiction where you kind of have an idea of where the story is going because you've read this type of story before. It's like a survival story you know, a classic man versus nature story. And yet, the, the sheer quality of the writing itself and the description and the way it allows you to experience this incredible journey, um, that alone is what keeps you reading more than the question of, you know, uh, are they going to make it or not? I always really love novels that have these lengthy sequences that just kind of take a break from everything else and are just like, okay, we're just going to focus on two characters and their one journey over the course of like a hundred pages or so. Uh, and this novel is the mother load of that, honestly. Thematically, this novel is really ahead of its time with its portrayal of a planet of androgynous people um, and its, its exploration of the concept of gender and how it's so kind of slippery and not really fundamental to human nature. Um, this novel was written in 1969, uh, but it feels so relevant today. There's also a major focus on the power of nature uh, and a focus on disputes between science and rationality versus mysticism. In this world, uh, people of the Akuman, this interstellar empire, have an ability called mindspeak, which is telepathic communication, but it's heavily implied that this is not due to a scientific discovery that they're able to do this. It's rather a sort of mystical thing that's fundamental to human nature. And there are other similar world-building elements that heavily suggest that this is a world where kind of the, the mystical and the scientific intertwine with each other. There's themes about religion and there's themes about politics and really it's just this kaleidoscopic blend of themes and elements that takes an extraordinary amount of talent to cram into 300 pages. This book didn't really feel rushed at all. It felt like it was exactly the right length. A lot of older science fiction I've noticed tends to be shorter than some of the science fiction published nowadays, and I love long form fiction, you know, but sometimes it is really, it's really cool and really impressive to be able to do this much in such a short novel. There's a lot more I could say about this book. It was just an absolute delight in every way, but I don't want to keep talking forever. So I'm just going to say that this book is clearly a classic for a reason. Uh, and if you're looking to, to read some more classic sci-fi, then I would absolutely 100% recommend this. Anyway, uh, that's all from me. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe, and uh, let me know in the comments if you've read this book or uh, if you've thought about reading it, I don't know. But anyway, see you all around.